Hello, and welcome to yet another fun lecture in American government. Today, we're going to be talking about campaigns and elections, which obviously closely related topics, um, two of the most important aspects of American government. Um, before we get started today, I need, to, I need to date myself a little here by saying I'm recording this in May of 2019. So the most recent presidential election was the 2016 race, and the most recent midterm election was last year in 2018. Um, you, those keeping score at home, 2016 saw Trump elected over Hillary Clinton, and 2018 saw the Democrats take control of the House and the Republicans hold control of the Senate. All right, so campaigns and elections. we got to start with talking about the method which we use to elect our president, um, the method known as the Electoral College, or the institution, I should say. Um, Electoral College is a system in which the president is elected by electors, not by the popular vote. And here's how it works. Each state gets a number of electors equal to the number of House members and senators they have. So Tennessee has nine House members, two senators, so Tennessee gets 11 electoral votes. California has 56 House members and two senators, so they get 58 electoral votes. Um, Wyoming has one House member and two senators, so they get three electoral votes. Um, and if a candidate carries a state, they get all electoral votes from that state with only two exceptions. Maine and Nebraska, I believe. But, uh, but typically, if you win a state, you get all the electors in that state. doesn't matter if you win by one vote or with 99% of the vote, you get all the electors. And in order to become president, you have to win a majority of the electoral votes. And what does that mean? 270. There's 538 electoral votes total. So divide that by two and you get 269 plus one is 270, that's a majority. Now, I need to specify here there's a difference in a majority and a plurality. A plurality would what be what you get if you got the more electoral votes than anyone else, but less than 270. Say you had three candidates. Uh, one candidate gets 260 electoral votes. One candidate gets 250 electoral votes. And one candidate gets... 28 electoral votes. The one that got 260 would have gotten the most, but they would not become president automatically because they didn't get half plus one. In a situation like that, the House of Representatives would then choose the president. And the way they would do it is each state delegation gets one vote, and the Senate would choose the VP. So the idea of the Electoral College is that, and the fact of Electoral College is that voters don't choose the president. States choose the president. Um, originally, actually, electors to the Electoral College were chosen by state legislatures. Today, they're elected by voters, so it's become a little more democratic from what the founders built and probably intended, but it is still not fully democratic. Now, as you know, it is entirely possible to lose the popular vote, but win the Electoral College and become president. Hillary Clinton got, I think, about 2.9 million votes more than Donald Trump did in the 2016 election, but Trump won the Electoral College, so he became president. Um, last time this had happened was in the year 2000 when Gore won the popular vote by about 500,000 votes, but Bush won the Electoral College. So this happens sometimes when 2000 was the first time, though, that someone had lost the popular vote, won the Electoral College since 1888. I remember in 2000 when this happened. A lot of people were surprised, didn't even know this was possible because it had been 112 years since the last time it happened. So it happens rarely, but it does happen sometimes. About 90, roughly 90% of the time, the candidate that get, wins the popular vote also wins the Electoral College, but about 10% of the time doesn't happen. Now, as you probably know, and you probably heard, Electoral College is controversial. Um, it's never really ran quite as smoothly as the founders hoped. In fact, originally, um, electors at the Electoral College each got two votes. And the candidate who got the most votes became president, and the one that got the second most votes became VP. 
And this screwed up in the election of 1800 when Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tied. Burr was running with Jefferson. They were part of a ticket. The idea was that Jefferson was going to be president and Burr was going to be VP. But one of the Republican delegates who supported Jefferson was supposed to withhold their vote for Burr to ensure Jefferson got one vote more became to make Jefferson president and Burr VP, but they didn't do it. So as a result, we got a tie, and it took the House of Representatives 36 ballots to eventually declare Jefferson the winner. And if you know anything about Aaron Burr's history, you can probably safe to say the, United, the young United States dodged a bullet there. If Burr had become president, we might not have a country today. Um, Burr, as you probably you may know, later um, killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Later was tried for treason, but that's another story. So this was seen as an embarrassment by the founders, so they went back and changed the Electoral College through the 12th Amendment, which puts the president and the vice president on the same ticket. Now, should we get rid of the Electoral College and go to simply to whoever wins the popular vote becomes president? That's a question you can decide for yourself. I would, I think, what we see in the debate right now on it is... Republicans support the Electoral College and Democrats oppose it, but for both sides, it's basically because of how it turned out in 2016. In other words, Republicans support it because their guy won, and Democrats oppose it because their, their, their candidate lost. If the, I have a feeling if the roles were reversed, say, and Clinton had won the Electoral College but lost the popular vote, it would be Democrats defending it and Republicans opposed to it, so... When you think about this, I would ask you to try to put aside like your partisan views and just look at it logically and rationally. I don't think very many people are right now. Um, in the videos and the supplemental stuff, I have a uh, article which argues in favor of the Electoral College and a uh, video that argues against it. So you can kind of weigh both sides and decide for yourself. Um, so that's how presidents are chosen. Let's talk about congressional elections. We'll get back to presidents after a while. Um... Congressional elections, originally there were no direct elections for the Senate. Senators were appointed by state legislatures. That was the case up until the early 20th century when the Constitution was amended to allow for the direct election of senators, part of the Progressive Era amendments. So now they're popularly elected. Um, a senator serves a term of six years. Um, a House member is directly elected and they represent an entire state. A House member is directly elected from districts within state within a state, and they serve two-year terms. Um, neither House nor Senate has term limits, so you can serve as long as you want to. And there have been members of Congress who have served over 50 years. There was a senator from South Carolina named Strom Thurmond who served until he was 100 years old. So you could be there in a very be, be in there for a very long time. Many states also have ballot initiatives and referenda. What this means, a ballot initiative is if you want a law passed but you, the legislature won't do it, you can write up a petition, write up a, a, a petition, and if you get enough signatures on it, it gets put on the ballot at the next election. If a majority of voters vote in favor of it, it becomes law. This is how marijuana was legalized in uh, Colorado and Washington State. So this is, Tennessee, though, does not have ballot initiatives. All right, presidential campaigns, the most exciting campaigns, the ones people follow the most. And I want to talk to you about some sort of random facts for you. Um, taller candidate tends to have an advantage. Since 1950, the taller candidate has won the presidential race every time except for three. Um, it's pretty rare that we have presidents with facial hair. The last one was Taft, who had a mustache. The last president to have a full beard was Benjamin Harrison, though maybe hipsters will, will bring that back. We haven't really had any really heavy, gross, um, great, um, very overweight presidents since uh, since Taft. We've never had a fully bald. We haven't had a fully bald president since Eisenhower. Um, point I'm making with this is that, as we saw when we discussed the Kennedy Nixon debates, image probably matters. Um, these things probably do make a difference. Is the best looking candidate usually win? I don't know, maybe. 
Um, candidates today, one of their strategies is to use what's called soft media. That would be that would be um, more celebrity type news or um, comedy um, shows like The Daily Show, for example. Oprah, back when she still had a TV show. Um, Bill Clinton famously played the saxophone on the Arsenio Hall show in the early 1990s, which a lot of people credit as a key moment in him ultimately becoming president. This is a lot different from the way things used to be back in the, I won't say good old days because they weren't really necessarily good, but long ago in 1896, William McKinley ran what was called the the um, front porch campaign. He ran his entire president's his entire race for president from his front porch in Canton, Ohio. He would come out every day and give a speech, and people would come from all over the country to hear him speak. Things have changed a little bit since then. Um, and the Harry Truman in the 48, 1948 election began what was called the whistle stop campaign. He would just jump on a train, get off at each stop, give a short speech, jump back on the train, and continue on. Um, image has become far more important thanks to TV, 1960, the famous Kennedy-Nixon debates, which Kennedy, people who listened to it on the radio thought Nixon won, but people who saw it on TV thought Kennedy won. Why? Because Kennedy just came across better on TV, because that's totally how we should choose our presidents, right? It's a fun fact, after 1960, we didn't have televised debates again until 1976. Why did we go 16 years? Well, in 64, Johnson was ahead of Goldwater by like 20 points, and he declined to debate him because that's, to use a football analogy, when you're ahead by, when you're ahead by 10 points with two minutes to go in the game, you just want to, you just want to run it up the middle and run out the clock. You don't want to throw any Hail Marys and let the other team get back into it. So... When you're in the lead, you tend to play conservatively. And, you know, if he debated Goldwater and Goldwater had won the debate, Goldwater may have gotten back into the election. So he refused. Nixon was the Republican candidate in 68 and 72. No way he's making that mistake again. So he, he refused. It wasn't until 76 that the, the incumbent president, Gerald Ford, was behind in the polls by 33 points, realized he didn't have much chance. The only real hope he had of winning was to debate Carter and beat him in a debate, so he challenged Carter to debate, and Carter accepted. Of course, TV is old news at this point, because we now have the internet, and the current president has made a big practice of using Twitter to get his message out. So social media has definitely become a lot more important. It's also made it harder for presidents, well, for candidates to get away with stuff, but it's also made them a lot more guarded. If you have every campaign appearance a candidate makes, there's somebody from their opponent's campaign there recording what they say, looking for them to slip up. So, while ironically, access has increased, it has also made candidates a whole lot more guarded as to what they will say, because if they get caught saying something that contradicts something else they said, that's going to show up, they're going to get caught, and it's going to show up in an ad for their opponent, or things they say can really be taken out of context, which also happens a lot. Um, primaries, brutal and divisive. It's always fun to see after primaries, two candidates in the same primary ran against each other, called each other all kinds of names, suddenly become best friends once it's over. Sure, they appear to be, though. Sometimes unknowns emerge from the process, too. Um, Barack Obama was not really well known in 2006, but two, two years later, he was elected president. Um, it's kind of interesting with the, uh, currently there's a large slate of Democrats who are running for president. I have no prediction as to who the nominee is going to be. Um, I wouldn't. There's very few of them that I would be surprised if they became the nominee. There's a few that would surprise me if they became the nominee, but not many. Because, like I said, it, a lot of it depends on how they perform in debates and how they, how they, uh, how they get, a, get over with, uh, with the public. Um, strong campaign organization is a must. This is something which tends to benefit incumbents. If you're an incumbent, you've, in other words, you've been elected for and you're running for re-election, you probably already have campaign offices. You have, you have people that work for your last campaign that you can call up and ask to work for you again. You have people donated to your last campaign. You can call them up and ask for donations again. So you already have an infrastructure in place, and this is, this is going to be an advantage for Trump going into the uh, 2020 election. All right, 
So founders were worried the president could become a monarch. In fact, the presidency was the branch of government the founders worried the most about. I mean, if we ever were to have a, mo a king or a dictator in this country, it's easy to imagine or easier to imagine that it would come from the president, be a president, as opposed to a senator or house member or Supreme Court justice. Um, we talked about the uh, race that McKinley ran from Canton, Ohio, from his home. Do we have a permanent campaign now? Pretty much we do. Um, I guarantee you, as of the day, the day after the 2016 elections, Already, speculation began on who was going to run in 2020. I guarantee you the day after the 2020 elections, same speculation is going to happen. Um, where do you, where and how to campaign? Although it may not seem like it, you have a fine, if you're running for president, you have a finite amount of money and time. So you can't visit every state, or you can't give every state the same number of visits and you shouldn't spend the same amount of money on every state. Probably one of the biggest mistakes Hillary Clinton made in the 2016 election was not going and campaigning in, in Michigan and in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania on election day. Had she done that, would the election turned out differently? I don't know, but I guarantee you that if she had it do over again, she would do that. Uh, money and time is typically invested in swing states. Usually about 10 states out of 50 is where you're going to spend most of your time and money if you're running for president because those are the ones that settle it. California, you know, is going to go Democratic. Texas, you know, is going to go Republican. Most states are either red or blue. So you go for the, the purple states. Um, in 2020, I can already almost get bet that these states are going to get a lot, of, a lot of money and a lot of visits from the candidates. They're going to be Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, Virginia, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, a few others, maybe maybe New Hampshire. Well, I don't know. It's kind of trending more to the left now. Maybe, 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 maybe Texas. Maybe a little early for Texas to become a swing state. Might be getting there, though. Arizona, probably. There may be some that surprise you, too. Most people didn't think that that uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan would become swing states, but they have now. Um, but yeah, most of the money is spent on um, on swing states. If Tennessee was a swing state, you'd see a whole lot more political ads than you see see uh, than you currently do. You saw a lot more ads for the Senate race in Tennessee in 2018 because it was a competitive race. Usually Republicans dominate, though, in Tennessee. Swing states are, tar are target, of course. TVs use target voters. More and more, the internet is as well. Um, timing's important. You don't want to peak too early. Um, sometimes candidates sort of hit their high water mark before the first primaries, and that's usually usually a death knell for you. Campaign finance. When Abraham Lincoln ran for Congress in 1846 and was elected as a Whig, he spent 75 cents on a barrel of cider. And that was his whole campaign expenditures. If you want to run for Congress today, it's going to cost you a little bit more than 75 cents. Um, if you want to run for president, it's going to cost you a whole lot more. Cost of a campaign usually is about 500 or 50 to 100 billion in the primary, then another 75 million in the general election. Federal funds are allowed, but they've mostly been opted out of because if you accept federal funds, you agree to limit your campaign spending. And thanks to thanks to the Citizens United case, most candidates can raise more money from private donations and they can get through the through the uh, federal funding. So that's probably dead now. Um, soft money, this is unregulated funds. Um, this is what is spent, what independent expenditures um, use. This is money that's unregulated, comes from corporations, unions, and wealthy donors, um, spent by PACs, which we've talked about for or against a candidate, but not affiliated with the campaign. Is money important? Absolutely. Is it always decisive? Not always. The Trump campaign spent less than the Clinton campaign in 2016, and the Trump campaign won, so doesn't guarantee that you have more money that you're going to win, but all things being equal, you obviously are going to want. If you, if you have the option of having more, having, being the campaign with more money or 
most money or the least money, you're probably going to want to go with the most, all, all other things being equal. According to the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1961, individual donors who donate more than $100 to a campaign um, are disclosed. So in other words, they become public record, which means that if you do this, every other candidate from that party that runs in the future is going to be able to see a record of you having donated money, and they're going to call you up and hit you up for donations. Um, federal rules are that you can contribute up to $2,000 per candidate in the primaries and not spend more than $95,000 over two years on various candidates. Um, talked about this already. Donors get disclosed. How much does it all cost? The answer is a lot. Um, if you want to run for the House of Representatives, several hundred thousand dollars. If you want to run for the Senate, millions. And this varies a lot from state to state. Since senators represent entire states, um, the bigger the state, the more money it costs to run for the Senate. If you're running from Rhode Island, where there's only three counties or five counties, three counties, I think, I'm not sure, but one media market, you only have to pay for ads in that one market, and you don't have to travel very far, so travel expenses are pretty low. If you're running in California, though, where you have, like, what, five or six media markets and you have to travel thousands of miles, then it's going to cost a lot more. So, but either way, it's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost millions of dollars. Um, and if you add up all the money spent by candidates, by the parties, by outside groups in the 2016 elections, this includes all elections for federal office, so House, Senate, and President, it adds up to about $6.8 billion. Think of all the starving kids you could feed with that. So where does it go? Biggest expenditures, radio and TV, internet to a lesser extent. Um, also consultants, pollsters, and travel. If you, want, if you want to run for president, typically you need consultants and pollsters that know what they're doing and they don't come cheap. And travel's expensive too. You gotta fly around all over the country, make appearances. Where does it come from, this money? PACs, donors, are the two biggest ones, private donors, who donates to campaigns? Um, the answer is people that care a lot or believe in the candidate. You know, the vast major the majority of donations that are given to candidates are from small donors. They, they're $100 or less. Um, donating $100 to a candidate or less is not going to get you any special consideration from that candidate. So the only reason someone would donate that would be would be because they believe in the candidate. Now, most of the money, though, comes from a relatively small number of big donors. So you may be asking, well, how can a majority of the donors donate small amounts, but a majority of the money comes from big donors? Well, simple. If you have, I'll put an analogy for it. If you have five donors who each donate $1, and then you have a sixth donor who donates $100, then or $95, I should say. If you have five donors donate $1, um, a sixth donor that donates $95, then one donor, then majority of the donations are from small donors, but a majority of the total donations, 95%, comes from one donor. It's also, some studies have found that about 15% of expenditures in some local and state races come from organized crime. Is there, organized, are there, is, is there an organized crime in your neighborhood? I've asked that question in class. Usually people don't like to talk about it. Though I've had a few that have actually named names. Don't ask me. I know nothing. All right. President is a candidate. Um, so typically a president running for re-election has some advantages. Um, it's estimated, or not estimated, about roughly 70% of the time an incumbent candidate running for re-election for president wins. Not that, of course, 30% of the time it doesn't. So too soon to predict what's going to happen in 2020. I wouldn't even hazard a guess at this point. If you put a gun to my head, I'd say it's probably about 50-50. If I'm still using this lecture in spring of 2021, you can laugh at me for being wrong. Or maybe you're right. I don't know. Um, wouldn't surprise me either way if Trump wins or loses. I wouldn't be surprised at this point. I'd say it'll be close. That's about the only prediction I'm going to make. Um, why does the incumbency give you certain advantages? Well, a few things. You have near universal name recognition. You get to travel around an Air Force One, which is a good image. When you make public appearances, hail to the chief plays. Um, you also have experience with foreign policy. 
And there's just the dignity of, dignity of the office, too. The foreign policy credentials are hard to get without being president. About the only way you could do it would be as an ambassador, for example, or maybe work on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee or be Secretary of State, but those are pretty hard to, uh, hard to get without being president. There's also the whole devil I know versus devil I don't know thing. You may not, if you, even if you don't necessarily like the president, you might take familiarity over change. I mean, there's sort of a human bias towards towards that. Um, you've also, if you're a president, you've been elected once, so you probably already have a campaign infrastructure in place to tap into the next time. So that's also also an advantage. All right, the issues. You want to stay on message. Focus on issues that will help your campaign. Um, so we know that certain issues generally benefit Republicans. Other issues generally benefit Democrats. So if you're running for president, you want to the campaign to focus on the issues that generally benefit you. We also know that elections are oftentimes an inco- a referendum on the incumbent. I think 2018 was to some extent. I think 2020 will be too. Um, I mean, really, I think 2020 probably will just come down to if you like Trump, you'll vote for him. If you don't, you won't. And that'll settle it, I think. Um, a lot of examples here, midterm elections especially, are referendums on the incumbent party. 94, the Republicans take the House because Clinton's unpopular. Um, 2006, the Democrats take take the House because, and the Senate too because, because um, Bush is unpopular. 2010, Republicans take the House because uh, Obama's unpopular. 2018, the Democrats take the House because Trump's unpopular. So, of course, you probably know, too, you shouldn't read too much into this because um, 94, Clinton was unpopular, but he won re-election in 96. In 2010, Obama was unpopular, but he won re-election in 2012. So, I wouldn't draw, too, you can't really draw any conclusions about what's going to happen in the next election from this. Somebody can be unpopular in today and be much more popular two years from now. Or vice versa, be less popular. So, I don't know. So, bread and butter issues. Guns and butter is the analogy people often use. Um, these would be the butter issues. The economy, health care, income. Typically, on average, they benefit Democrats. Some exceptions, but generally. Um, Republicans are usually more skeptical of social programs, of uh, things like health care reform, of social security, things like that. And typically, these programs are popular, so Democrats usually, though not always, benefit from this. Um, the other side would be foreign policy issues, war and peace, international relations. Um, these issues tend to benefit Republicans. Um, foreign policy generally does. So if you're a Democrat running in 2020, you probably want to make the election on health care as much as you can. Um, if you're a Trump running for election, you might want to make it on foreign policy and national security. Then there's just random stuff, the imponderables, as they're called, which can't really be be quantified. And what does this mean? Um, scandals that may break one politician have little seem to have little effect on other politicians. I mean, Trump has been a master of getting out of scandals, much like Bill Clinton was too in the 1990s. Things that would have sunk other other politicians seem not to sink them. And this is really hard to explain and hard to quantify. I don't know what it really, there's not really a deciding factor here. Um, some history here in Grover Cleveland, ran for re-election in 1888. He lost to Benjamin Harrison. Well, he, he lost the Electoral College, but won the popular vote. So he lost the presidency. Um, delegates at the Republican Convention in 1888 chanted, Mama, where's my pa to taunt Cleveland? The reason being was that it had been determined that that um, Cleveland had fathered a child with his mistress. And this was, of course, to humiliate him. Later on, though, 1892, Cleveland came back and ran for ran again for president and won. And his supporters countered this with, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? He's gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. Um, another example of this would be Nixon with the uh, Czech, famous checker speech in 1952. Um, the Republicans had had uh, recruited Dwight Eisenhower to be their Republican, be their candidate for president in 1952. Eisenhower's general, who'd never held public office before, so he chose Nixon, who was kind of a political insider, to be his running mate. 
Um, Nixon and Eisenhower never really liked Nixon, though. And during the course of the campaign, it came out that Nixon had, in one of his Senate races, had had an illegal slush fund. And Eisenhower, and this, of course, hurt the Eisenhower campaign, and Eisenhower was angry about this, and he was ready to dump Nixon from the ticket and get a new VP. But Nixon went to Eisenhower and said, hey, let me go on TV and explain my side of the story. And Eisenhower's response was okay, but if you don't get this fixed, I'm going to get rid of you. So Nixon goes on TV and gives a speech in which he defends his conduct in the slush fund, said basically he did it to save the taxpayers' money. And he closes by saying that someone had sent, one of one of the donors had sent his daughter, his six-year-old daughter, a Cocker Spaniel puppy dog named Checker. And they, the little girl named it Checkers. And no matter what they said about Nixon, he was going to keep the dog. And this is called the Checker speech. And it worked. Um, Nixon weathered, um, weathered this scandal, survived it, went on to become VP, served as VP under... Eisenhower, for eight years, went on to lose the very close 1960 election, went on to become elected president in 68. 20 years later, though, he got into something he couldn't talk his way out of, and that was Watergate, which ultimately led to his resignation. Um, in the 80s and early 90s, Dan Quayle was vice president under George H.W. Bush. Quayle famously misspelled potato. In fairness to Quayle, he was doing a spelling bee at a school and on the cue card, potato was spelled with an E on the end, and a kid spelled potato correctly, and Quell's response was, no, it's wrong, because he was going by what the cue card said, but made him look silly. Now, in fairness, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I could I could see myself making that mistake too, trusting what the cue card said. Also, if you've been out campaigning, say, for 12 hours that day, and you're exhausted, I could see that too, but a lot of people made fun of that, and that's sort of something that dogged him for the rest of his political career. Played into the existing narrative of him, that he was kind of a lightweight and not particularly smart. Um, in the 1990s, Bill Clinton had all kinds of issues. Juanita Broderick, Jennifer Flowers, Monica Lewinsky, accused of uh, sexual harassment, even, even sexual assault. But he was able to talk his way out of most of these scandals, things which would have sunk anyone else. Um, negative campaigning. If you just lived through the 2016 election, may have been the most negative in American history. And as you'll see, that's saying a lot because there have been plenty of negative campaigns before. Um, attack ads, mudslinging does work, can be overdone. If the sense is that it's that it's um, unfair, then it can it can backfire. But it has been present all the way through our history. In the 1790s, um, George Washington who was President Washington was accused of having been a British agent during the revolution of selling out the country. One political cartoon showed him getting his head chopped off in a guillotine. In 1800, Jefferson was accused of being the Antichrist, so that's a not a new charge for presidents. Selling out the country in one car and and a fathering a child with one of with a slave he owned, which by the way is probably true. Um, 1804, Hamilton and Burr sell their political disputes with a duel in which Burr kills Hamilton. 1828 was a vicious one. Andrew Jackson ran against John Quincy Adams. Um, one of the uh, pamphlets distributed at the time and asked this question, Alda convicted adulteress and her paramour husband be placed in the highest offices of this free and Christian land. Um, Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel, had been married before and had divorced her husband, or so she thought, but it turned out that their divorce hadn't been finalized when she married Andrew, so technically she had committed bigamy, and of course this Andrew Jackson actually fought several duels over, over this. Uh, another pamphlet said Jackson is, quote, a gambler, a cockfighter, a slave trader, and the husband of a really fat wife. So, class. Um, Jackson gave as good as he got. He he accused he um, he accu he accused um, Adams of wearing silk underwear. Get it, cross dresser. Um, 1836, Congressman Davy Crockett made the same charge against Martin Van Buren. Said he's laced up in corsets. There is a rumor spread in the 1860 election that Lincoln only changed his socks once every ten days. During the 1876 election, there was a rumor spread that Rutherford B. Hayes had shot his own mother in a fit of rage. Um, 
1884, there was the Blaine, there was a candidate, Republican candidate president named James Blaine, and the, his opponents chanted, Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. So, <laughs> catchy, I would say. Um, 1964, the we get the famous Daisy ad, considered the most devastating political ad in American history, nuked the Goldwater campaign. You can watch you can watch a video of it, or you should, because it's on the supplemental stuff for this class. Um, the knock against Goldwater had been that he was kind of a cowboy, kind of um, unhinged. So that played into that. So is Goldwater the guy whose finger you want on the button? Um, Goldwater's campaign slogan that year was, In your heart you know he's right. Johnson campaign reversed that to, In your guts you know he's nuts. Um, difference today, though. Although negative campaigning has been with us since the beginning, there is a difference today, and the difference is there the quantity. There is a whole lot more of it, and it is unescapable. Like back before 100 years ago, the only place you would see negative campaigning would be at camp, live at campaign rallies or in newspapers. Then TV comes along, so you get TV ads for the first time. Now, you could avoid that, obviously, by turning the TV off. Now, with the internet, you can't avoid it at all if you get on the internet. Now, I mean, you cannot get on the internet, but, I mean, get real. Life today is so intertwined with that that it's pretty hard to function in society if you stay off the internet. And if you get, off, get on the internet, you're going to be exposed to negative campaigning. All right, got to talk about the polls. Everybody uses polls. Everybody likes to crap on pollsters, but everybody uses them. If you run for office, you'd be a fool not to. So do so do media as well. Um, they're used to determine a candidate's strengths and weaknesses. Professional pollsters are hired by campaigns to find out the states they're doing well in and target those states. Um, there's a lot of speculation about pollsters skewing their results or doing this or that. But by and large, they do not. That's not to say they don't make mistakes. They do, but if they're wrong, it's usually an, it's going to be an honest mistake. Because, I'll tell you why, if you're a reputable pollster, um, putting out fake polls would doom your business. If you're running for, and, you, and if you're a professional pollster, you make your money by selling your services to political campaigns. And political campaigns are going to want accurate polls. Do you think that Hillary Clinton is mad at the pollsters that, told her that she was ahead in Wisconsin and Michigan in 20, right before the election 2016? You think she'll hire them again? Of course not. You want a pollster that's going to tell you where you're struggling so that you can address that early on. Same principle as you go to your doctor. You don't want your doctor to tell you you're perfectly fine and then two years later find out you have cancer. You want to, If there's something wrong, you want to find it out as soon as possible. So a pollster really doesn't have an econo any kind of monetary incentive to fake polls. Now, that's not to say you won't find fake polls out there. You will, which is why you have to look at who's putting them out. If it's a reputable polling organization, then they have some credibility. If it's an organization that seems to have never put a poll out before, then there's a good chance it is a fake. You just have to know what you're looking for. Good rule of thumb is if the poll publishes their methodology then they have credibility. If they don't, then I would not give them any credibility. All right, campaign techniques. TV and the internet are widely used. There's the fam some famous ads, the rats ad from 2000, which might be subliminal. When you watch the video of this, watch carefully. You might see rats appear subliminally on the screen. Then there's the daisy ad of 64. We already talked about that. Um, televised presidential debates. Um, the first one was 1960 between Kennedy and Nixon. If you listened on the radio, you thought Nixon won. If you saw it on TV, you thought Kennedy won. Again, simply because Kennedy came across better on TV. No more debates until 1976 when Ford challenged Carter to debate. Carter won the debate and won the presidency, but in 80, Reagan and Carter debated. Reagan defeated Carter in the debate and went on to win the election. Reagan's a former actor, so of course he does really well on TV. Um, 92 is kind of an interesting one because it's the only one in which we have a third-party candidate included, Ross Perot. Ross Perot was the uh, independent that year. He took part in, the, uh, in a three-way debate with Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush. 
All right, can politicians be bought and sold? Joke I've always heard is politicians can't be bought, but they can be rented. <laughs> um, one of the strategies of negative campaigning is to affect the public's perception of a candidate. What do I mean by that? Well, if it's particularly if it's an unknown, a candidate that a lot of people don't know about, they have only a short time to define themselves. Like, in other words, what do you associate, when you think of a candidate, what do you associate them with? And if you hit them with an effective negative ad, then the public might associate them with that ad or something negative in that ad, which, of course, will hurt them. Um, famously, in 1988, um, oh, Michael Dukakis um, was running against George H.W. Bush. Dukakis, there was a famous video of him traveling in a, a tank, and the caucus looked ridiculous. So that ad got used, and that ended up hurting him. Or there was the famous Dean scream from 2004. He had came in third in Iowa, and he gave a speech in which he promised to go to all the other states and win those states, and eventually and go to the Washington D.C. and take back the White House. And he made a really weird noise. You can watch the video of this, and that ended up hurting him too. Um, you hit like so. One of the goals of negative ads is to get people to associate the target of the ads with something negative. Um, some famous ones, the Willie Horton ad, which is kind, of, which is a, one of the most controversial ones because it probably played on racial um, racism a bit, um, or maybe more than a bit. Um, dealt with a with a uh, prisoner named William Horton. They call him Willie Horton in the ad. I guess they thought that sounded sketchier or something. Um, the ad, it's worth noting, is this was against Dukakis in 88. Um, worth noting that there was a weekend furlough program for prisoners in Massachusetts at the time. It had actually been started by Dukakis' um, predecessor, who was a Republican, but Dukakis continued it, so it's, it's fair to, um, uh, fair to use it against him, I guess, but as you see the picture of Willie Horton, it's obvious kind of what they're going for. Or the Kerry windsurfing ad kind of makes Kerry look... Kerry was the Democratic nominee in 04 who lost to George W. Bush. Windsurfing ad obviously designed to make him look look goofy. Um, all this costs money, though, so if you have more money, then it's going to benefit you. Special campaign managers, I mentioned James Carville and Carl Rove. They're two of the, two of the most famous ones. Um, you think con campaigns now are contests of personalities? Do you think that the 2016 election was really about issues, or do you think it was about the personalities of Trump and Clinton? It seemed to me it was a lot more of the latter than the former, but you can make that call. Congressional campaigns, so we got to talk about this. Usually begin, about two, usually begin about two years in advance. So if you're in the House and you serve a two-year term, it begins the day, af the day after you're elected. If you're in the Senate, yeah, you get about a four-year break before you start start having to hardcore campaign again. Usually better to stay on the left or the right. The system we have today, and one of the reasons <coughs> that Congress has so much difficulty getting anything done, is that our system does not reward compromise or moderation. It rewards extremes. Most of the congressional districts are gerrymandered. In other words, they're drawn specifically for... Democrats or Republicans, and there's very few s districts that are actually swing districts anymore, which, mean, which means that a Democrat and Republican have a roughly equal chance of winning, like, say, the third congressional district here in Tennessee, which is the one I live in and many of you live in. The odds of a Democrat winning a rural Tennessee congressional district are extremely low. So if you're serving as representative from this district, you're a Republican, most likely, and your chances of losing to a Democrat are extremely low. On the other side, you have a much bigger risk of another Republican challenging you in the primary and beating you. And if you are seen as being too liberal, too moderate, a sellout, willing to work with the other side, then you might get primaried and you might lose the primary. So your best bet, if you want to stay in office, is to be as conservative as possible. And that means not compromising, not working with the Democrats. Same thing is going to be true of Democrats. Most of them, if, you, if you're a Democrat representing, say, Memphis, 
same thing's true. A Republican's not going to win there. So your only real threat is going to be another Democrat who runs to your left in the primary. So again, there's no reason for you to compromise either. This last, earlier this year, the government shutdown that went on for 35 days, neither side wanted to back down because why would either side want to back down? If the Republicans back down, their base is going to see them as sellouts and turn on them. If the Democrats back down, their base is going to see them as sellouts and turn on them. So there's no incentive for either side to do it. And this is why getting things done has become so difficult. There's no, if you're somebody who's willing to compromise, you're more likely to lose re-election than if you're somebody who's grandstanding. <laughs> um, if you're running for Congress, if you're a candidate, you have to develop relationships with prominent leaders in the community because they're the ones that donate money to your campaign, and they're the ones who introduce you to other rich people. Um, your lifeblood is going to be donations. What role do political parties play? They provide funds for realistic candidates. In the 2018 election, did the, you think the Democratic National uh, the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee, or National Parties, I should say, both donated equal amounts of money to all their candidates? No. They went through every House race and every Senate race in the country, found the ones, wrote off the ones they that were in the bag for them that they had no chance of losing, wrote off all the ones they had no chance of winning, and poured all their money and time into those ones that they could win or lose, the swing ones, which comes out to roughly about 10%, less than 10% of all house races. There's 435 house races every two years. Usually only less than 40 of those are actually competitive, but that's where all the money is spent. The Senate, 30, one third is up every, every uh, two years, so 33 or 34. Um, usually though, 10 or fewer of those are actually competitive. And so they tap those races, they spend their money and time on them. Usually if a the National Party stops funding a candidate, it means they've given up on them. It means they don't think they have a chance at winning. Um, if they tap your race, though, they'll send you money. They'll send volunteers to your district or to your state um, to hold rallies for you. Also volunteers to go door to door and encourage registered Democrats or registered Republicans to get out to the polls and vote for you. Congress is extremely unpopular, usually has an approval rating of about 15%, yet the re-election rate is incredibly high. Incumbents win over 95% of the time in the House and about 80% of the time in the Senate. Here's some re-election rates from 64 to 08 for the Senate. A little lower, the House, extremely high. Why do we keep re-electing the same people over and over if we don't like the job Congress is doing? The answer is because most people approve of the job of their own representative in Congress, but disapprove of Congress as a whole. So my guy's doing a good job. It's everybody else's guy that's screwing everything up. Also, gerrymandering is a thing, too. As I said, the districts are all drawn to benefit either Democrats or Republicans, so there's very few actual swing districts anymore. We've gotten to the point now where instead of constituents choosing their member of Congress, members of Congress choose their constituents, which probably is not how it's supposed to work. Midterm elections. 2018 actually bucked this trend a lot. There was way more interest in the midterms elections than there had been in, I think, I think had the highest turnout for a midterm election in, I want to say, 100 years. Could be wrong about that. But it's the biggest one in a long time, which I think is good, actually. It's good that people are more interested but it's atypical. Is this going to be a change, or is this going to be the way it's going to be from here on out, or is this an anomaly? I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully people will stay engaged, but typically there's low turnout in midterm elections, and this means that they're usually more driven by partisanship and incumbency. When a president, presidential election, whichever party wins the presidency, wins the White House, usually picks up seats in both the House and the Senate. But in the midterm elections, they usually lose seats in Congress. So the 2016 and 2018 elections followed this pattern. The Republicans picked up seats in uh, 2016, but overall lost seats in Congress in 2018. So that followed that pattern. All right, so talk about voting facts here. About half the world's countries hold regular free elections. Um... 
theoretically voting voter voters are supreme in a democracy it's the most important um input in a political system many countries have multi-party systems some countries require people to vote the united states of course doesn't some key questions here do enough people vote be great if everybody voted problem is of course if you're just going down to the polls on election day and pushing a button that's not good i mean voting is more than just doing that it's um voting is more than that it's also about researching the candidates and figuring out where they stand and figure, thinking about what you want. Some people don't vote. Why not? How do they decide? Do elections make a difference? You can think about it. If you're getting back to the question of who should participate, two different views of it, two different models, you could say, going back to two of the founding fathers, Hamilton and Jefferson. The Hamiltonian model is that leave governing to the experts. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're, if you're sick, you go to the doctor, right? Because a doctor is an expert on medicine. They know more about it than you do. So you defer to their expertise. If your car won't start, you take it to a mechanic. Same reason. Mechanic's an expert on car. Knows more about it than you. So you defer to their expertise. Gov why should governing be any different? Some people have a talent for governing. Governing. Some people are more knowledgeable about it. And those are the people who should govern. Your average person out on the street is not an expert. Um, you don't. Go, you wouldn't ask the average person on the street what to what to do if you had the mumps. So why should we trust them with the nuclear launch codes? The other side of that's the Jeffersonian model. This argues that more people should be involved, and a more involved and a more engaged public will produce better government. Um, the, weak, the weakness of the Hamiltonian model is if it's mostly elites governing, then they can, obviously, they, they can rig the system to their benefit. The weakness of the Jeffersonian model is that if more people are participating, you may get more people don't know what's going on. So neither model is really perfect. You can decide which one is closer to what we want. About half public, usually on average, votes in presidential elections. About 38% vote in midterm elections. Although, as I said, this last one really overturn that. Turnout was much higher 100 years ago than it is today. Now, it's worth mentioning that the electorate was a lot smaller 100 years ago. African Americans couldn't vote in many states, and women couldn't vote yet 100 years ago, although by 2020 will be the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. Here's voter turnout since 45. Here's uh, turnout in Lower House elections, courtesy of Wikipedia from 1960-1995. So Australia leads the world in turnout with 95%. But it's compulsory there, so you're required to by law. So no surprises. Malta second. They don't require you to vote. 94%. Chile, Austria, Belgium, Italy, Luxembourg, Iceland, New Zealand, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Greece, Venezuela, Czech Republic, Brazil, Netherlands, Costa Rica, Norway, Romania, Bulgaria, Israel, Portugal. So the United States doesn't even make the first page. Finland, Canada, France, United Kingdom, South Korea, Ireland, Spain, Japan, Estonia, Hungary, Russia, India. Finally, the United States. We lose to Russia. Why do they even hold elections in Russia? Oh, and if you look at this asterisk, asterisk, triple asterisk here, you'll see only congressional elections held the same year as presidential ones. <coughs> so they don't include midterm elections in this, which if they did, wow, we'd probably be losing to Switzerland and Poland. Go us. Why is voter turnout in the United States lower than other democracies? I don't have an answer for that. One thing may be that we take it for granted. Um, many of these countries that we're, I'm comparing to have become democracies more recently than the United States has, so we maybe take it for granted in ways that they don't. That could be part of it. Maybe we're just spoiled and lazy. That may be part of it, too. I don't know. This is, this is a little uh, concerning, though, because, again, as a republic, it's the people who govern, and if we're failing to fulfill that role, then we're probably going to get bad government. I think Winston Churchill said, or attributed to him anyway, that in a democracy, voters, citizens get the government they deserve and hard. 
So, all right, sociological factors. Who votes? Who doesn't? Typically, you can, if you look at these variables, you can see how people vote. Um, geography, age, race, sex, income, education, religion, class, occupation, all these things coincide with turnout. Typically, older Americans are more likely to vote than younger Americans. Here's a chart. Here's some charts from the Census Bureau for the 2008 election. As you can see, the older um, males are blue, females are orange. Um, on average, women vote more than men. This is true across all age groups until you get to 65 and older. 65, 74 are roughly the same. Only 75 and older are men significantly more likely to vote than women. All the others, women are significantly more likely to vote than men. You also note, the older you get, the more likely you are to vote too. 18 to 24 year olds, 41%, 48%. 70, uh, 6, 65, 74 year olds, 70% for both. You wonder why Social Security and Medicare are such big issues in every election? There's your answer. Because old people vote a lot more than young people. If young people voted in bigger numbers, then politicians would take their concerns more seriously. Which is why it's important for you all to register to vote and get out to vote. If you want, if you want the government to take your concerns and address your concerns, then you need to get out and vote. I guarantee you that if 18 to 24 year olds, 70% of 18 to 24 year olds voted, there'd be a whole lot more focus on issues relevant to them and, and to you. I'm a good chance you're 18 to 24 years old in every election, much like there is for 65 plus. Women are more likely to vote than men. Education also correlates with this. Um, the higher level of education you achieve, the more likely you are to vote. Typically, um, if you high school dropout, the people who didn't complete high school are the lowest in terms of turnout. Um, advanced degrees are the highest. In general, African Americans are a little less likely to vote than whites as well, on average. Um, ideologues, people who identify as liberal or conservative are more likely to vote than moderates. If you're interested in politics, you're going to vote. This is pretty no-brainer, obviously. Closer an election is to, the greater the turnout typically is. About third to almost half of Americans don't regularly vote. Why? Maybe they're not registered to vote. Maybe they don't like the candidates. Maybe they're too busy. Maybe they just don't care. Two-party system may be partly to blame. I do know this. I hear a lot of people complaining about how they don't like either candidates. 2016 especially, I heard that a lot, that a lot of people didn't like Clinton or Trump, either one. So if you don't like either candidate, why go vote for one of them? There's what they say. Of course, tack ads and negativity only makes this worse. A tack ad either makes you dislike the target of the attack ad or the candidate running the attack ad, or maybe both. So if you don't like either can if you didn't like either candidate before the 2016 election, the campaign was so negative from both sides that there's <clears throat> little to make to change your mind, I don't think. There's not much that would change your mind, I don't think. Um, you may be too busy if you work long hours. Um, early voting in Tennessee should help. This is not all states have early voting though, or you just don't care. How do people decide? Sociology or psychology? Um, sociology would be your whole class, race, gender, education, geography, age, etc. The single biggest factor in how you vote and your political views are how your parents vote and their political views. Um, most people roughly have the same political views as their parents. This is not true always. I mean, there's obviously exceptions to this, but the single biggest determinant in how you vote is how your parents voted. Then there's psychology. Um, this would be that, or sociology would be how you're socialized. So your parents believe this, you typically grow up believing it too. Psychology, though, says that this is not just learned behavior, it's what's hardwired into your brain. And there have been studies that have looked at identical twins who've been raised by different families. They're more likely to agree with each other politically than with their adopted parents, which suggests that, while well, I'm not saying there's necessarily a political gene, I am saying that like worldviews and how you view the world might be genetic, and, of course, your worldview really is what determines your politics. So there's sort of a role for both um, social, how you're socialized, and also for genetics as well. 
um, retrospective voting. This is what probably what we're going to get in 2020. This is where you people are going to look at the past four years. Has Trump done a good job? If your answer is yes, you vote for him. If your answer is no, then you don't. Um, prospective voting would be what we had in 2020. Neither Trump nor Clinton had been president yet, so you could only use look at their histories to to make an educated guess as to how they're going to vote, how they're going to govern, but you don't know that. Rational choice, people put their law of economic theory, um, people vote to serve their own best interest. Again, nothing wrong with that. That's if you don't look out for yourself, no one else is going to do it for you. But what you need in life may vary. If you're poor, then you're probably going to be more in favor of, say, social programs, things like that. If you're rich, you're going to be more interested in tax cuts. Um, if you're in a certain industry, you probably want less regulation of that industry, maybe more subsidies for that industry. So, again, there's nothing inherently wrong with this, but also if you don't look out for yourself, again, nobody's going to do it for you. But on the other hand, it's as with a, so if someone's trying to sell you something, you should always, always have it in your mind that they have a vested interest. Voting patterns. Really? It just comes down to this, urban and rural. Well, there's a lot of other factors too, race and gender and things, but if you look at a map, county by county map of the 2016 election, the map will overwhelmingly look red. It'll look like Trump won in a landslide, but he didn't. Popular vote, he didn't. The reason for this is because Republicans win all the almost all the rural counties, and Democrats win almost all the urban counties. So it's an urban-rural divide. And I mean, you see this right now. I mean, if you're out in, I don't know, Bryceville, Tennessee, you drive 30 minutes to downtown Knoxville, it's a different world. Electoral system, talk about this. Uh, Candidates once chosen by party bosses. Now we have the different types of primaries. We talked about a um, we talked about primaries already. So we talk about this suffrage. States can set requirements on voting. Only minor ones. Um, residency requirements. What does it mean to be a Tennessee resident? Is it if you you can only set up reasonable residency requirements? Is it reasonable to require you to have lived in Tennessee for six months before you can? be a Tennessee resident, be able to vote in our elections? Maybe. Would it be reasonable to require you to live in Tennessee for 25 years before you be a resident? Probably not. So courts are going to throw that out. Um, these days, um, about the only choice states have in terms of who they allow to vote is with felons. Convicted felons are not allowed to vote in most states, even after they complete their sentence. Um, in a few states, they are. I know Bernie Sanders is sort of... Um, gotten stirred up, or um, started a debate, I guess I should say, over over whether or not prisoners should be allowed to vote. But reality is, in most states, if you're convicted of a felony, you never get to vote again. Maybe that should change. Maybe. Um, also, I should mention this age requirements. Also, the con per the 26th Amendment of the Constitution, you have to allow everyone who's 18 years of age or older to vote. States do have the option, though, of setting age requirements lower than 18. They can't set them higher than 18, but they could set them lower. And I think there have been a few cities that have lowered the voting age to 16, I believe. Um, is that the next frontier in expanding voter rights? I don't know. Voter registration. You have to register to vote in advance before you can vote. Um, permanent or periodic registration. Permanent means that once you register, you're good until you move. Periodic means you have to renew it every periodically, every so often. Um, Tennessee, we have permanent registration. Must register in person in most states, although in Tennessee, I think you can just do it online now. If you haven't registered, go register. Secret ballots were in every state by 1950. Um, in the early 19th century, we had oral voting in some states. That just meant that you go down the polls and tell the poll worker who you want to vote for, and they write it down. No potential for abuse there at all, for sure. Um, party column ballots, office column ballots. A party column ballot is when 
It's where all the Democrats are on one side and the Republicans are on the other, and office column ballots where they're just organized by offices they're running for. The dot bottom line is on a party column ballot, you can see which party everybody is in. On an office column ballot, you cannot. And this influences how you, how people vote. Party column ballots increase straight ticket voting by 60%. So people know nothing about the candidate, but if they have an R or D next to their name, maybe that's all they want to know. Um, counting, votes are counted electronically, recounted by hand if necessary, voter fraud. It's a thing. It exists for sure. In-person voting fraud is extremely rare, though. In other words, someone pretends to be someone else and goes vote. I think there have been like 35 instances of it in the last 10 years out of nearly a billion votes tabulated. Um, voter fraud would probably be more likely to be stuffing the ballot box, maybe even hacking into our voting systems. Hope that doesn't happen, but of course, this is hard to measure. As with any crime, it's very hard to measure this because you can't just ask people if they've done it. All right, last thing I want to talk about are three types of elections, maintaining, deviating, and realigning. A maintaining election is when things are the same after the election as they were before, so the same party remains in control. A deviating election is when there's a change in party control, but it doesn't last long. And a realigning election is when there's a change in party control and it lasts for a very long time. So an example of a maintaining election would have been the 2012 elections. Um, when the same party controlled Congress before and after the election and the same party controlled the White House before and after the election. A deviating election would have been 1952. Republicans take back control or take control of Congress and they win the presidency but they lose Congress back just a few years later. A realigning election would have been 1932 when Democrats win both the presidency and the Congress and they hold them both for about 20 years. All right, and that is all the things I want to talk to you about today. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you back here next time. Have a good day.